Sunday is Dank Podstash Day, and today is episode 94. Before we jump in, I gotta say thank you to the Dank Podstash super supporters, Maxwell, Dave, and Dennis. You guys keep the show rolling along with everybody else on the Dank Podstash Patreon, and I appreciate it more than you know. The Dank Podstash is officially sponsored by Project Sparta. Now is the time to get healthy and in shape. Greg Papa Nicholas is going to get you there with personalized meal plans, training, group support, and tons and tons of amazing fitness and motivational resources and knowledge, including the Project Sparta Facebook group. You can go to ProjectSpartaCoaching.com and learn more about Greg's work and get started on your path to health. In this crazy world we're living in, our health is more important than ever. Get up, start learning, communicating, training. One of the most important and often neglected things in life is your physical health. Get to ProjectSpartaCoaching.com now and get after it. Shout out to Voluntary Apothecary. Voluntary Apothecary is here to fulfill all of your beer care needs. They carry beard oil, mustache wax, beard butter, and more. I only use their beard care products and I love them. You can check out their amazing products at VoluntaryApothecary.com and your boy Damon's going to hook you up. Listeners of the show can take 10% off your order with code DANK, that's D-A-N-K, at checkout. One more thing, the Dank Podstash is teaming up with Road to Anarchy for a monthly newsletter and more. Road to Anarchy is an online magazine connecting groups of voluntary individuals who are looking to increase their freedom from the state. Becoming more self-reliant and developing a better focus on becoming a productive individual is the only mission. The only division is against the state. No matter your flavor of anarchy, finding your road to anarchy is the first step to progress. The time is now to put our individual differences aside, join up, and create change. You can go to roadtoanarchy.com to sign up for the monthly zine or to patreon.com slash thedankpodstash and get signed up with any tier of support. Check out the Road to Anarchy Facebook page and groups to connect with other individuals on the Road to Anarchy. Where is your road taking you? Now, this episode 94 is with one of our aforementioned super supporters, Maxwell Chi. It was a fun conversation. Love the guy. Great talking to him. And don't forget to get on that Dank Podstash Patreon and see what he had to say in the after hours. Enjoy the show. Enemy of the state. An enemy of the state. Enemy of the state. Dank Podstash. You're listening to Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. Check out thedankpodstash.com to find every episode of the Dank Podstash, links to support the show via our Bitbacker and Patreon, Dank Podstash merchandise, and much more. If you'd like to advertise on the Dank Podstash, email us at dankpodstash at gmail.com. We're back again for another episode of Enemy of the States, Dank Podstash, and today I'm joined by Dank Podstash super supporter, Maxwell G. What's going on, man? What's up, man? How are y'all doing? Oh, to be honest, frustrated. I know everybody's frustrated right about now, but <laughs> for uh, for the lack of communication between people mostly when it comes to shit going on right now, everybody wants to choose a side and be right without any nuance or anything yeah and the way i see that there's there's only two sides i mean you're either against the state or you're for it you know what i mean sure. at this point the way i see you know, this partial stuff where people are like talking about oh we need some type of organization over us and just it doesn't make sense to me no the way i see it it's cut and dry where yeah well either supporters of the state or not it's frustrating man because people are like oh yeah well of course but then they were still dividing along left and right and economic systems and all that kind of stuff and i think the thing that i'm seeing right now that's really bugging the shit out of me is well I know you've seen my post and the Podstash post, and you've posted about 
these unmarked um, federal agents going to the different protests and doing that stuff. And everybody's straw manning their way into supporting them because they're going after the quote unquote commies. And now the thing that happened last night is a guy named Garrett Foster, who's apparently a libertarian boog boy. I can't confirm that, but that's what people are saying, who is killed at uh, an Austin BLM rally. And so people are saying, oh, good riddance to another BLM person. And it's like, well, first of all, fuck that. You don't have to support the BLM organization to realize that someone being killed at one of those protests is wrong. And second of all, they're saying he deserved it because he was blocking a I don't know. There's just so much shit. You can look up the articles or I'll post a I'll post a link in the description of this one to the best article I've found on it. Dude wasn't blocking the car. It doesn't look like he fired shots. According to Austin PD, the only shots fired were fired from inside the car and he got killed. But it's just fucking frustrating because there's so many people who are just ready to condemn this dude because he was at a BLM march. Yeah, I haven't even heard about this yet. That's that's insane. It's it's like look, like I try to tell people, I support the statement of Black Lives Matter for sure. I do not support the organization, but at the same time, I support the movement in that we need to do something about the real oppression which yeah. is, of course, the state and their enforcement agencies and all the people that work for them that follow their orders. So. Yep. No, nope. And it's just playing into their hands to have more division. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I can't support an organization whose founders or whoever runs it or whatever, as long as it's, this is true information, have claimed to be trained professional Marxists. It's like, okay, well, I'm not into Marxism, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to support that. But like you said, supporting the, the statement and the people out on the street is fine. As long as they're not fucking with other people for no reason, you know, it's just so fucking wild. Like uh, everyone, it seems like everybody, first of all, wants something to be mad about. Uh, not that there, it like, there isn't enough to be mad about anyway. It's just the littlest thing sets people off. And it's like, what is, is this even doing anything? All the marches and protests and stuff, like what's what's being accomplished from this? That's what I want to know. And it, it, to me, it feels like a more of a detraction or a distraction in that sense. Uh, like, go look over here while we do all these horrible bipartisan things to so further subjugate you and uh, further extort you for whatever reasons you know let's pass all this legislation while people are distracted and that's just how it always works and that's how it... there is some semblance that I think people do realize it happens but I think people are so numb to it at this point that oh it's the you know it's just like oh that's just what Congress does and it's like at some point, it's just ridiculous. So it is. It is. got to do something about it. Yeah, and the question is what? And, you know, I've been thinking about that, what to do about it, especially since, like, the way I started thinking about this is um, coming from, you know, Boog stuff before the massive crackdown on the Boog pages and even the hashtags and stuff like that. Um, that was getting pretty popular, so I, I suppose that's why there was a bit of a crackdown on that. But that's a whole nuanced conversation in itself is the boog but um i was just thinking because i've had conversations with like daniel you know daniel and many other people um the anarchists are what like less than a tenth of a percent of the population so even if we had did have a boog or a civil war or something like that there's certainly no guarantee that the result would be how we wanted it you know the the world that we want to live in think there'd have to be compromises made and then the other thing i've been thinking about is i talk to a lot of people in real life who are interested in something new and aren't quite ready to jump you know full into anarchy they're not there yet um because it's not something that, that you can necessarily just you know flip on um some people need to take baby steps and whatnot and they end up saying well what about like the libertarian party and 
We all know how much I like shitting on the Libertarian Party and how much <laughs> most anarchists don't like the Libertarian Party because it's like, come on, guys, you know this shit, but you're still being fucking statists. But I've been thinking about uh, secession and, you know, if we were able to get to a point where the federal government didn't have as much power over the states as it does now, like a, a step back in the way that the U.S. is. I don't know. How, how would you feel about that? Would you be a little a little okay with going back to a place where the state you lived in didn't have the feds breathing down its neck and you maybe had a better chance of living how you wanted to? Well, let's just put it this way. I'd be more okay with that than this complete centralized control. Uh, it's like a Abraham Lincoln dream come true if you were alive today to see it, you know. Um not i don't want i still you know just like you i'm i'm all for zero rulers the word word for word definition of anarchy but <clears throat> hey if uh states want to succeed and take the right steps i'm uh, i could live with that for now because at least we're curtailing that's like real progress that's like real action that's occurring to curtail the state so right ultimately at the end of the day i'd love to see people embrace self-ownership again i guess the term self-ownership i look at self-ownership and um as kind of uh inversely uh, an inversely proportional function to the growth of the police state as mm -hmm. self-ownership declines mm -hmm it allows a police state to grow more and more and more as people are just more comfortable looking to, they don't look at them as rulers, but they really are looking to them to protect them. And I'd love to see everyone buy a gun, two guns, whatever, protect yourselves, walk around with guns. I don't care. You know? Yeah. You want to you want to crime, you know, put a gun in everyone's hands. Yeah. But anyway. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's uh that's it's not a very popular theme in at least the US right now and I'm sure a lot of other places it's not a very popular theme either. Self-ownership, personal responsibility, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, and you know that's that can be seen very easily by all the shit that people are pushing for, all the people things that people are marching for and stuff. You're like, "Fuck yeah, you know, dissent in the streets it's getting crazy and then you find out they're just marching for different legislation or who knows what anything they're just petitioning the government in a different way and yeah i think i think the state is definitely riding the chaos of this year and whatnot and the media as well and really just focusing on the parts that aren't really doing anything i think that's the distraction from getting shit done Oh, I 100% agree with you on that. It's just, I guess the, mm, at the end of the day, it's all fear driven, right? Mm -hmm. And the media has been absolutely perfect lapdogs of control, you know, to help the state control everyone through and pushing fear tactics, pushing um, the whole, you know, go visit this whole COVID thing in 2020 and, and just everyone's scared. I thought, I thought actually Texas was starting to do better, but then, you know, we all saw it the second wave <laughs> in the media and now everyone's freaking out and you can't even go into a store without a mask. You know, you can make some shit up and tell them I got medical issues and they're still like well we still want you to leave and it's like i don't know it's almost like biblical almost you know you can't buy sell whatever without the mask of the beast or whatever. yeah yeah the mark of the beast well shit man it's not that far off um i've, I've been saying for a while like if it goes to vaccines like you have to have the covid vaccine i'm trying to pull up an image right now that i saved it's gonna they're you know they're gonna do like they're doing with masks they're not gonna let you in the store 
um, but it's going to be further. They're not going to let your kids go to school. They're not going to let you get a driver's license or a passport or maybe plane tickets, anything like that. And I think that's how they're going to enforce it. Similar, similar to the way that um, I think it was Boulder. I'm sure many other places, but Boulder, Colorado, when they were doing their quote unquote assault weapons ban, they didn't outright ban them. They just uh, levied fines like it was like a thousand dollars a day, something something like that. Um, if you were in the city limits and had a whatever they defined as an assault weapon registered to your name is like a thousand dollar a day fine. So people were just leaving because if you're there, they're just going to find you until you, they can throw you in prison or whatever. But the image I just found, it, it's a it's a stack of uh, SWAT team about to breach a door on the front of just a regular house. And it says how you think mandatory mandatory vaccination will work and then how it will actually work is a uh, debit card declined on like the little machine at a grocery store or whatever. I think that uh, indirect control versus just straight up force is i think they're moving much much more towards that way of forcing people to do things and that's definitely how that'll go yeah and then didn't, uh like a month ago the orange dictator basically put out a statement saying oh when vaccines are ready we're mo mobilizing the military and we're going to make sure everyone gets uh gets their shots right now. I mean, it's like people are being conditioned, you know? Yeah. And the, the, the right wing Trump supporters, you know, it's, they'll, they'll gobble up anything he says. So that's his mechanism. That's their mechanism sir, for suppressing them. And of course the anti-Trump left, uh, they all want vaccines or most of them anyway. So they want, more importantly, they want you to get a vaccine, you know, and they're willing to willing to back state force and violence against you to get one. Mm -hmm. And if you don't still, they're willing to back that you can't put your kids in a school or whatever. It's insane. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if they're going to go the route of, of that kind of stuff, of not being able to put your kids in school or the stuff that I mentioned, you know, the licenses, the use of electronic currency, which it seems like they're pushing really hard with this uh, supposed coin shortage and uh, people not accepting cash and all that shit. Now's mm. the time for Agoras to shine, man. It's time to build those underground businesses and uh, make sure that you're stable and that you can help other people be stable should they come to you, you know. It's, I mean, it's the same thing in history in every uh, authoritarian or totalitarian state, whatever, where the black market shines at this point because people are cut off from everything else. Oh, I agree. Look at something simple like uh, legalizing marijuana in California, right? Mm. Which, which, uh, which basically just gave the state ability to assist in being the drug dealer and collect the booty associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but something like that, even today, California black market weed sales are predicting they're outselling the dispensaries by 44%. So the Agora is still shining in that aspect yeah. over there. But that's something simple. Wait till it gets ramped up. And you're going to have black market everything, which isn't a bad thing. <clears throat> that that we have competition it's the bad thing is the state's willing to put bullets in you over it so sure or at least throw you in a cage at least throw you in a cage absolutely but fuck yeah i don't i'm not sure how to how exactly to work i know a lot of people are into like gold and silver and stuff like that should they should they freeze your assets in whatever bank accounts and your cards and whatnot or switch to a whatever u.s dollar coin or something i'm not really sure of the workarounds on that, because I know a lot of anarchists and agorists and everybody are into crypto and stuff. And then there's a lot of people who are uh, anti crypto. They're like, why, why are you okay with this electronic currency and not a U.S. dollar coin? Oh, I see the cat. <laughs> Sorry, had to break there. <laughs> but then I know there's uh, there's farm stands and stuff out by me that only take cash. And I'm sure they would very easily swap over to taking gold or silver um, currency of whatever type. I'm just not sure uh, 
how well it's going to mesh. I, I would imagine it being decentralized with people swapping all kinds of different stuff to get around having to use a U.S. dollar coin will will work somehow. But I guess maybe that's the problem. As I'm as I'm saying this and thinking about it, is thinking that there needs to be one thing to use against it. And I think uh, people having technical skill sets able to do something of some fashion to help, you know, whether they're good at computers, IT, whatever, you know, that, that stuff will go a long way as well in the overall bartering exchange, you know. Yeah. Just stuff like that. So I think it's it's like every night in the back of my mind when I go to bed, I'm, I'm always thinking, okay, in, in my current life where I work for a – um, I work in the oil and gas industry and um, as an engineer and um, I'm thinking to myself in the back of my head if the shit goes down one day what am I going to be able to do to provide some type of technical service you know mm -hmm. in exchange for whatever well, what'd you I land like on? the fact you bring up farmers <laughs> I'm sorry what's that what'd you land on what are you going to do you got me curious now <laughs> Well, um, from a manufacturing or a process system standpoint, I guess my biggest skill sets is I probably could automate just about anything. Nice. From a con machine control system standpoint. So that's probably where my best, if I were to hedge, that would be it, you know, do to other people automate processes or even even somewhere in the dab a little bit in the software engineering side hey do you need me to build you a database or something like that do you, an automated database where stuff's talking to each other mm -hmm. pulling records and writing records just stuff like that so hell yeah useful as fuck man automation seems like it's the way of the future Yeah, so personally, that's that's what I'm going to hope to fall back on because in my mind, something's going to happen in the next five to ten years on the track we're on. I mean, we you go back and look at – how old are you, Nick? You're in your late 20s? I'm uh, 33. 33. So you were definitely um, – so 9-11, you were – that was 20 years ago, uh, 13. So you, you – got it said you know you remember that stuff like the back of your head right i watched it happen and you got yeah. to see you got to see the expansion of the government the federal government especially over the next over the past 20 years basically mm -hmm. and what's what's all happened in the acceleration of authoritarianism and totalitarianism to this point you know it's like in my lifetime, I go further back and, and, you know, I try to think about the 90s because that was my childhood. And, you know, I don't remember the Reagan assault weapons ban mm. in, when I was a young child in the 80s, but I do remember reading about it in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking at things like, oh, all these little subtle different tyrannies that are starting to escalate, but then we hit 9-11 and now it's like, gone hyperbolic it, to me in my lifetime it seemed like the if there was a unit of measurement for the level of tyranny is like linear and then when 9 11 hit just went hyperbolic you know sure. over the years you know so i don't think we're far off i don't think so either and i've been i was you know leading up to the craziness of this year and even at the beginning of this year i've been trying to keep things in perspective i'm, I'm trying to ask myself is, has shit always been this crazy and I was just too young to remember or, you know, people's memories suck about it or history paints over it or we look at it differently after time has gone by or is now actually as fucking crazy as we think it is? Um, are things really getting really crazy really fast? And I think it is. Um, the more and more I try to apply uh, that, the, that fact that I might be having some sort of bias because I'm in it right now. Uh, versus not having been in it in the past, um, I think I think it's a little different. I think now is a little wilder, and that's not necessarily to say 
compared to all times in history, but, you know, let's say within the history of the U.S. Like, this is definitely unprecedented. Absolutely. Like, small business owners allowing the state to shut them down. Mm. If, you know, if I'm a proprietor of a small business, so like a, like a, like a hardware store, like let's say I own my own little mom and pop hardware store and the government's telling me I got to shut down and I see all these motherfuckers going to Walmart or Target or whatever, you know, that shit. <laughs> I mean, it's the, what's happening on that aspect is pretty, pretty plain cut and dry, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because honestly, honestly, if you're really worried about COVID-19, you fail safer going into a hardware store where there's like 15 people inside looking around or you feel safer going into a Walmart where there's 150 to 200 people, right? Yeah, and gross people know. too. <laughs> Usually the people that go into mom and pop store, <laughs> they take a little bit better care of themselves than the people of Walmart. But And it's true, man. It's um, fucking watching this stuff happen and even the smaller stores and restaurants, bars, whatever – like out here around me, you know, they didn't give a fuck about masks for a long time. They're like, you can wear a mask if you want. You can wear a mask if you don't. They catered to elderly and immunocompromised people who were worried about it. They made specific shopping hours early in the mornings for them if they wanted to go. And that's fine. You know, that's their decision. Mm-hmm. And recently it's been um, mm-hmm. enforced, you know, no mask, no service, because all the places out by me, all the small places have been getting threatened with, you know, state violence. It's exactly what it is. It starts out with tens of thousands of dollars in fines down to pulling licenses, down to closure of the business. And it's not just because state health inspectors have gone in and seen them not enforcing the mask mandate, but it's because fucking snitches have called and said, hey, there's people in the store without a mask. They're not doing it. They're not doing it right. Down down to the bar where you have to wear a mask when you walk in to where you sit down or sit down from where you sit down to go back to the bar and get another drink. It just, it doesn't make any fucking sense. And it just infuriates me that people are calling the state agencies on these places in the communities where they live. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. uh, It's that sick. That's, that's like the, I guess if there's a, a number one reason for me to be upset about this whole thing, it's, it's, it's the, it's the snitches. Mm-hmm. It's people like you and me, everyday people, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I think about the time frame, like today's people versus if we we're back in the late nineties or something like that, would they be snitching back then? Mm-hmm. Maybe not as many, but I don't think as many, I think there would be some, but I don't think not as many, but over the last 20 years with the progression of subtle tyrannies and implementation of such and, the mental conditioning, you know, during, you know, the, during the last presidential administration, you had the big Obama ads going, uh, if you see something, say something, you mm-hmm. know, that's to me, that's just little subtle, passive aggressive mental conditioning that people have to recognize it for what it is. If we're not out there, you know, trying to point that out to people, not trying to force my beliefs on anybody, but, I would like more and more people to be able to recognize these little subtle passive aggressive tyrannies and, and, and getting us to report on each other. And it's just like, for example, my father, um, shoot in his seventies, really good shape, loves to play tennis, plays tennis twice. It's about, uh, back in March, he lives in California too, Oakland, California, by the way. So he shows up to public tennis court where he and a partner play. And he had the uh, first time he had the police called on him. And the second time he had the police called on him. And it's just like, man's going, you know, he's in his 70s, you know, maybe 10, 20 years, you know, who knows when my father going to pass. But mm-hmm. he really wants to do something that he enjoys to do. Mm-hmm. It puts absolutely zero people at risk. It doesn't infringe on anybody's rights. Yeah, at the same time, people call the police on it. Just you know, going we're, to we're, places? we've reached that point. Yeah, just going and go play tennis. 
I guess the city took the nets down eventually. Jeez. Sorry, what what point were you going to say we've reached? I I think we I mean we've hit that point where we got to be worried about our neighbors at this point, mm. you know. Mhm. We it's just and that's why it's also important to talk to our neighbors. Yeah, know? exactly. That's what I was going to say. We got to find a way to stop at that point and reverse it or go a different route because fuck, I can't remember where I was reading it now, but I was reading, reading about the Soviet state in Russia. And um, I think it said something about the, I can't remember the exact definition of Soviet, but it was uh, really interesting the way they broke it down and people, the reason people snitched on each other was because they were more afraid of the state cracking down on them than whatever uh, pushback uh, shit they would get from their neighbors, you know, for snitching on them or for, for being like that. And if they would have just like, look how many of them there are compared to the Soviet state. Look how many of us there are compared to the state. Now we just have a dialogue even if even if you're fucking mad at someone for not wearing a fucking mask, if you talk to them calmly or something and you guys figure out that you can just leave each other the fuck alone instead of calling the state, that kind of dialogue, the nuance in discussions from person to person, from neighbor to neighbor in community, and not only there but online, for fuck's sake. I mean, I don't think that's ever going to happen because people like being dicks online, but that dialogue, that nuance that needs to happen and shift the direction we're going so that we don't become... Uh, you know, worse as far as a culture of snitches, a, a Karen culture, you know, it's gone from speak to the manager to let's speak to the fucking police department, speak to the health inspector, all that stuff. We could take it in another direction, but I think people have to, to see what's happening right now and to look at history and see that very similar things are happening now. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. it's, and, and you're right. I, I, the way the way I see it, all the, you know, in the last ten years, you know, ten to twelve years, we've seen them really ramp up on trying to divide people, and they chose a very simple, very simple, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A very simple um, frame, so to speak, the whole left-right thing. Mm -hmm. which to me, I don't even think it really exists. I, I think it's a bunch of garbage and another mechanism of control. So I try to ignore it. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't really, but, right. but they took the whole left, right narrative and used it to divide people and, and ramped it up over the last 12 years. But what has that created? To me, that's created, hey, I'm willing to snitch on that guy. Hey, I'm willing to let the state go in unmarked vehicles snatch people off the street because i don't agree with them you know so many quote-unquote anarchists are mm -hmm. willing to let the state take care of their so-called enemies and they don't even know who the real enemy is in my mind <laughs> right no you're right the left right doesn't exist yeah. within the state because they all fucking do the same shit they're all in it for themselves for the state in general and it really only exists in the people right. they've bamboozled into being mad at each other. And it's made its way all the way down the pipeline into the anarchist and libertarian movements and all that stuff. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, can you guys not see this? Can you not see how obvious this is and you're still fighting over that stuff? It's I try to I try to ask this question. And it's like like people who get mad about like and TIF or ANCOMs or whatever. It's like, I'll ask him this. So some, who has taken more from you and extorted more from you and robbed more from you in your lifetime? These Antifa folks or the state? Mm -hmm. You tell me who the enemy is. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Well, and you know, they always come back with that, what, fuck it, was it defensive, uh, what do they call it, defensive violence, defensive, uh, self-defensive violence or whatever. It's like, you know, them commies, they might come after me, so I got to stop them first. It's like, well, or they, they would want the state to do this, so fuck them. They're getting a taste of it. And it's like, they would, they could, you know, it's not happening right now. Like you said, the state is doing it right now. And if they're doing it to them, they'll do it to you. Absolutely, man. It, and it's so frustrating seeing people go back and forth on that. It's like, 
you know, in in the utopia that you and me and many others dream of, if ANCOMs want to go form their own little commune and do their thing, I'm I'm cool. I'll still even be friends with you or whatever. You know, if you want to call me up or you want to trade something, fine. Good with that. Sure. Just don't 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 uh attack me. I won't attack you, you know. Yeah. And caps you're the same. You wanna go and do your thing, whatever, you know. Well shit, man. Even outside don't of make a, it. a fucking utopia, even in because I don't think the state's ever going to completely cease to exist. I think there's always gonna be states, uh just hopefully smaller, you know. Yeah, yeah, fine. I'll trade with people who are happen to be in a statist model wherever they're at. It doesn't mean I have to interact with the state. Um, just leave me alone. That's what it comes down to. Just fucking leaving each other the fuck alone and respecting each other's right to be left alone. But that seems to be the hardest thing to get across, the hardest thing for people to do for some reason. I haven't figured that one out yet, despite all my time sitting and thinking. <laughs> And, you know, along that line, the one thing I have a hard time figuring out, the question I always get asked, you know, I have lots of conversations with colleagues and friends and stuff like that. And and I, I really enjoy, they're very, they're always typically very cordial conversations. I try to get people to see I'm not this crazy radical mm -hmm. <laughs> that wants chaos and mayhem or whatever. And it's, um, they always that they always say the same thing though it's like oh your ideas are great this and that they're great but what's the alternative what's the solution it's like the hard question i can't give you a solution i can't say this is how it's going to work mm -hmm. but one thing i could tell you it's a hundred thousand times better than what we have today sure and it, at least the because option thing, is oh go ahead no, sorry, you go ahead. I was just saying at least the option is better, but go ahead. I guess uh, what I'm going to say, um, you know, people are always saying, well, then, you know, the psychos or the everyone will be loose and, you know, the criminals won't get punished or this and that. It's like, well, look at it this way. You look at the state and to me, all I see is a platform of protection for the nastiest and dirtiest of all murderers, extortionists, pedophile, mm -hmm. rapists, kidnappers, and so to, so to say, and in the absence of the state, those fuckers no longer have a platform of protection. That's right. They either A, be on their best behavior after that, or B, <laughs> get dealt with when they try to you know, oh, the warlords are taking over. No, they're not taking over. They're already here, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping to have a, a speaking of warlords, that reminded me, I'm hoping to have a conversation with uh, a fella here in a few episodes that should be pretty interesting going over the idea of like the robber barons as the beginning of government, you know, uh, warlords, roving bands of thieves, whatever that figured out, hey, if we leave everybody alive in this town that we just ransacked, then we can keep coming back and taking more from them and they become the robber barons and whatnot. Or, um, I don't know, there's a whole lot of other ways. I think that's the most likely way versus uh, trading off security for freedom. But even if we have, like, throughout time, we, meaning humans, have decided, all right, these organizational organizations, these hierarchies, as far as government go, are a good exchange of safety for freedom, you know, it's clearly not the same as it was. It's, it's, the the scales have clearly been tipped, and all of the answers that were supposed to have mm. been, or all the questions that were supposed to have been answered, like you're saying, the questions that people ask you, they're not answered anymore. It's been exploited. the The way that they were answered has been exploited to make it how it is now. So I don't know. I was I was looking up another meme because you keep reminding me of memes, and there's a really great one. <laughs> Uh, this nerdy looking dude who says uh, unless you can tell me how anarchy can solve every problem that statism has failed to solve then i must continue to believe that statism is the only way to go checkmate <laughs> and it's just like for fuck's sake it's not about answering every question it's about giving you the option yeah i, I like that one i've seen i think i've seen that too <laughs> 
Now remind me of the whole uh, Robert Hicks quote about, you know, the violence and mayhem that could come with anarchy. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, mm -hmm. but the violence and mayhem could, that comes with anarchy is completely wholly conjectural. Mm -hmm where the violence and mayhem and chaos of the state is absolutely measurable and real. Yep. So. I fucking love Robert Higgs. I wish he still did appearances. That speech of his, the, the was it the state is too dangerous to exist? I'm pretty sure it's where he, he said that quote too, but God damn it, that's inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. So good. So recently, uh, in the past few months, I've been um, exploring out west of Houston. There's a bunch of dairy stuff going on, and I've been able to get my hands on raw milk and unprocessed eggs and everything. And nice. I'm just trying to reach out and uh, to people willing to do that stuff under the table or whatever. And I will fully support it because I hope they're not giving the state a dime, you know, Yeah. on what they do. So okay. that's what I've been trying to do recently. So you, you have been able to find some of that stuff going on? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. I heard about it actually in some underground car games in Houston. Nice. <laughs> Cause all the, all the card rooms closed down for a while and, I was uh, in and out of some underground card games and met some people, and they put me in touch with some people, so it's pretty cool. Hell yeah, man. See, that's exactly it, that's that, and that would be the gray market, you know, rising up when it's needed. And, you know, that stuff exists mm -hmm. uh, outside of these crazy times. There's always been people still selling raw milk and um, eggs and all the farm stand stuff like we were uh, talking about earlier. Drop off? It's just good to, it's just really good to support them right now of all times, especially if you can do it with cash or alternative currencies and stuff. <laughs> Where'd I lose it? I'm back. It? Sorry about that. It's all good. I, I killed my Wi Fi for a second, reconnected just to get it back. So, oh shit. <laughs> but yeah, I was just saying it's, it's really good to support that kind of stuff right now. Um, of all times, if we're going into some sort of a totalitarian state, hopefully those underground, you know, produce and animal product uh providers are, will be robust going into that so they can keep serving people who need it yeah i've just you know thought of things that little things i could do to prep for the worst and one of the big things is making connections with people who actually can provide services that you'll need so hell yeah have you discussed uh, alternative payments to cat or to you know American dollars to U.S. Uh, fiat currency, or is it still on just the cash basis? It's just a cash basis. I don't know. You know, that's one thing. I'm, I've got some Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but right now I'm, it's scary. It's scary because I've seen what banks are doing now. They're offering you a Bitcoin ledger, and what does that tell me? It's all mainstream at this point. Mm. And, and it seems like the powers that be are trying to put their fingers around it at some point. Yeah. I think we're going to need an option to like a good solid option of Bitcoin at some point. Well, get a hold of a dude named Branch Ellison who was on the show a few episodes ago. Um, that dude's awesome. Uh, I really like the idea of the privacy coins. I'm not huge on Bitcoin. I got a little bit of that floating around too, but I like the idea of the stuff that you don't, that you can have your fully private, secure wallets and not have to put any of your actual info behind. Um, I think that's good. But I'm also a big fan of like junk silver and um, small denominations of precious metals and stuff as well. Right. At the end of the day, all that stuff has its uses for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, gold's still one of the best. Uh electrical conductors in the world so sure yep at this point yeah and it's yeah and that whole con that whole conversation is so interesting and i did have a great conversation with branch about the uh, crypto and whatnot but I, <laughs> I i'm always trying to get people on to really break down and answer these questions of you know why is crypto um why does it have value like what is its intrinsic value and i think most people come back to the idea that it's the ledger not necessarily the coin the um 
I don't know, whatever. Oh, fuck. I just totally lost the word. But it's the the point of the technology, not necessarily the coin, which is great. I just can't see, like you said, people who have raw milk and eggs and stuff like that or produce for sale really wanting cryptocurrency when shit hits the fan. It just doesn't seem like an exchange that people who have the things we need to survive uh, are going to want. Yeah, I think um, most people are going to want something physical in exchange, whether it be precious metal or some type of service that can exchange some type of mutual agreement. So Mm -hmm. if the shit really hits a fan, hopefully I'm ready to say, hey, what do you need automated? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, but... You growing some weed, I can fully automate that process for you. Oh, you know? see, there you go. Hey, it doesn't even have to be growing weed. It could You could go automate uh, backyard vegetable patch systems and shit like that. There's a couple of interesting things out there that yeah. they have already. And if you could find a way to set that up with shit from the local hardware stores and, you know, computers, whatever, that'd be awesome. That might just be a business you could do now. Certainly can help out the agricultural industry in that aspect, but I'd like to get into something that 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 definitely has a demand. Oh yeah, <laughs> growing food for certain. <laughs> yep, and even through even through a shit hits the fan scenario, you know, there's always going to be a man for a demand for the vices, for weed, any anything, <laughs> booze. Who knows. Maybe you could set up some automated stills for whiskey production. Oh, I agree. That stuff will be in demand too. Yeah. <laughs> look oh, how yeah. many look how look how many people talking about drinking, you know, alone at home during all this stuff and bars closed and it's like me, I'm I feel lucky. I've never had an addiction to alcohol. I drank a lot for a long time, but when I decided Hey, I'm going to quit drinking or I'll drink. Like right now I drink like four times a year and it's usually it's just like two beers or something like that. So you don't drink when you're playing cards and stuff. No, uh, what I used to do, uh, so I did it for a living back in 07 and early 08. I moved to Vegas uh, and I did play poker for a living what i do when i got into the more touristy games and stuff like that the some of the smaller games i would order like a alcoholic beverage and i'd nurse the same drink for like six hours Mm. and then try to put get some acting going like uh be jolly you know one thing i found out about the game of poker is people don't mind losing money to you nearly as much if they like you there you go. Yep. So I was after trying to create a persona with these folks that was likable, friendly, and uh, hey, in somewhat of a way, I found that to be an exchange of service, you know. There you go. I'll tell you what, <laughs> the fucking, if, if government's uh, playing that poker game right now, they're not very likable. <laughs> I think yeah. that's why we're having so no. many fucking issues. People don't like the idea that they're saying, you know what, just shut the fuck up and take it. Versus, I don't know, trying to show compassion or anything like that if they're even capable of that. But fuck, that's anybody. That's anything. I think that's probably the biggest complaint I see about ANCAPs is, you know, you guys aren't very fucking likable. Uh, there's not a whole lot of compassion coming from that side of the argument. It's all really cold, hard economics that kind of stuff and it's probably it's the opposite with the the further left it's more um more feelings and i don't know how things should be according to how they feel about it i think there's like like we've been saying there's got to be a middle ground somewhere in there because these things can't exist separately yeah I, yeah i'm on board with you on that too a lot of ancaps i know you know people need help they wouldn't find it worthy at all of their time or money or whatever. And where the ANCOM try to be more supportive, they're probably a little bit more compassionate than the other side of things. But 
Oh, it's interesting. At the end of the day, you know. It's, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's interesting too. It's your um your story about about poker and people being happier about losing money to you if they like you. Like that just look at <laughs> look at the idea of the, the fat cat, you know, capitalist. A lot of people don't like that. And they could be offering a good salary and whatnot. And that's really turning people off to the idea of that whole system. It's like they fucking don't like that guy. He looks scummy. Or the people out there doing ANCAP marketing and stuff that come across as really scummy. It might be a good deal, but they're not catching many flies because it seems like vinegar that they're putting out, not honey. Mm. Yeah, that's a good uh, analogy right there. But regardless, the, the game of poker the state's playing against us or we're playing against the state, it's a terrible gamble, right? Because mm. the odds are completely stacked against you. Mm-hmm. They have the um, monopoly of legalized use of violent force. And um, they can just come take your money. Mm-hmm. Or they do come and take your money. They can come kidnap you. They can criminalize just about anything you do and throw you in a cage. So, yeah, bad game to sit down. And unfortunately, we're forced to sit in this game. <clears throat> yeah, so. absolutely. No, you're right. And that's something that I think is a really good topic to broach with people that you're trying to talk to about this stuff is the monopoly on violence. Really explain what that is to them. Um, I've had a lot of success in getting people to understand what I'm against and what I'm for by explaining what actually what the state actually has as far as a monopoly on violence. And I've sent a lot of people, I don't know if you watched that documentary by the same name yet, Monopoly on Violence, but that was, that came out at the perfect time. Lots of people I know, um, you know, in, in real life, not online, have watched that on my recommendation and think it's fucking sweet. I've seen part of it. I've seen part of it. I've been meaning to thank you for reminding me of that because I've been meaning to go see the rest. It's good, man. Anything that can, anything that can show people with good, you know, solid arguments of, of in explaining the monopoly of violence that the state possesses is just, you know, the more and more people get that into their heads, it's like creating that cognitive dissonance where in the guy's head, he wants to do the right thing, kind of like the voluntarist portion of his brain versus the status portion mm-hmm. of his brain, right? Mm-hmm. You can create that conflict within their brain. It's like then that's the seeds that need to be planted. So That's damn right. Seeds with memes, seems with documentaries, conversations, man, nuance. Having these conversations, yeah, it's good. Uh, speaking of which, we just about flew through that hour, man. I think we're going to call it right now and jump into the yeah, Patreon after hours. <laughs> yeah, man, it's been a great conversation. Heck yeah, loving it. First time I've ever actually talked to you, too, so that's been pretty awesome. Fucking A. Yeah, I'm glad you came on the show. Like I said when I first messaged you about it, you already denied posting memes for me, so I guess I got to get it out of you having you on the show. <laughs> it's all good, though, man. It was fun. I'd love to, man. I told you I'd love to. I'd love to. I, the, the time throughout the day is crazy. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Well, I got this hour from you, and so the did everybody one. listening. <laughs> but, man, I, I, I certainly enjoyed it. Man, yeah. I got... I gotta tell you one more story. Yeah, go for it. Um, one thing um, I've been thrilled of in the, what we've seen in the past ten years, at least, is with the advancement of you know cell phone technology, is these camera things we got on here, mm-hmm. and more and more people recording police stops, police uh, interactions with people. You got those guys out there. I absolutely admire them. They'll go sit right outside a police station and just record, 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 get harassed by police and basically shove it in their face with their own laws and rules. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, we've all seen those videos and I absolutely dig those videos. But one thing um, that gives me hope about that is what I've seen in the last 10 years is. Um. 
you know, we all grew up and our parents told us, obey oh, police, you know, this and that. Police are here to protect us. And we're all indoctrinated in that and so forth. But what I've, what, what I've seen with, without trying to sound like a weird term, but say, quote unquote, in white suburbia over the mm. past 10 years, I've seen more and more people wake up and that's because people are recording them, you know. I agree. And people are coming across these videos that would never have gone searching for them, but they're seeing them. They're seeing how cops interact with people. They're seeing, and even if it's just little seeds over time, in the long run, there's nothing good, nothing but good can come from that, from people seeing what police really do, what they're all about, and what their goals and objectives really are. And it's not to protect you and me. Yeah. You're hundred percent right. No, and it's becoming more popular in the mainstream. I mean, you know, we know that there's people that have been doing this for a really long time. Um, I don't know, think about police, the police or the free thought project and stuff like that. And they've always been on the fringe. Right. But now you got people like he's a pro kickboxer and he was on the Joe Rogan podcast, Joe Schilling, whose whole Instagram page is police brutality stuff to try to make people aware of it. And I'm, you know, and in one on one hand, it's frustrating that the people who have been doing this for so long haven't gotten the credit for putting that out there, for getting the word out there. But on the other hand, it's really great that it's becoming big and mainstream like that and people are seeing it. So either way, I'm down with it. Yeah, and that's why that's why I'm always trying to tell people to try to go check out what Jason's doing over there on the Free Thought Project and so forth. It's uh, That guy's been doing amazing things forever, and it's... Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, he's owed some credit. <laughs> he is, big time. Maybe I can get him on the show. Maybe after the rebrand or something here pretty soon. That'd be awesome. I'll reach out to him. But fucking A, man. Let's jump into this Patreon after hours, and uh, we'll ask that million-dollar question that I ask everybody, and that's going to be in the uh, the montage of all the guests for episode 100. So if you want to hear that, you know where to go. It's on the screen if you're watching on YouTube, patreon.com slash the dank pod stash, and you can see the after hours. Max, you see him. You see him. You're there. You know where they're at. But fucking hey, dude. Absolutely. Thanks for uh thanks for coming on the show and for being a super supporter, man. That was a great conversation. Looking forward to doing this after hours. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure. Hell yeah. Remember everybody, total freedom, no exceptions. Enemy of the States Dank Pod Stash is sponsored by Project Sparta. Go to ProjectSpartaCoaching.com to learn more. I'm in